Well, oh, it's been quite an interesting couple of days, really, isn't it? Absolutely, I, mean, really, yeah, I quite enjoyed not, it. Not, um, not seen one for 11 years. What's that? I think I'll start uh, with an issue. I, I started at LWT as a, an engineer and it was on outside broadcasts, and at the time we shot and recorded on, and so did the studios, on quad tape, two inch tape. And, and editing then was an engineering function in the VTR department. So I would have never been an editor at LWT ever because I was in the wrong department. You didn't use to splice the tape. You actually used to cut the two-inch tape. I used to, used to develop it and cut it. We talked all about oh, that oh. yesterday. So. Yes, I used to cut um, play schools um, on, uh, with a razor blade, one single recording because it was cheaper that way, one tape. You cut it. If you made a mistake, you were in big trouble. And if you're cutting the tape, you'd have jumps on the cuts, unless you've got the eight-field sequence right. No, 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 no problem with two-inch tapes it at all with a quad. Okay. No, the problem was the sound, because the sound and the vision was displaced. You, if you cut for vision, then the sound was all over the place. If you cut for sound, the vision was over the place. So you had to lay off onto a quarter-inch, and it all became a bit of a... Dex dexterous is the word. You needed to be dexterous with syncing up quarter-inch to the two-inch, and it all happened in 10-second run-ups, and it was, it was interesting. It was interesting, but very, very, very basic. You didn't have edit controllers or anything? Ab basically. No, no, there were no edit controllers. There was or time code. <laughs> there was no, no time code. There was an editor. There was an editor that would actually do an electronic cut when we started copy editing on two-inch, but there was no controller to get the two in sync. It was wind the two tapes back 10 seconds, put a little China graph mark on the tape, run them simultaneously and at the point you had chosen on the edit machine the edit would happen now if the player was too loose too tight then the, the assistant which in my case w which it, in those days was me as an early when I joined in 69 you tighten you move the tape two inches one way two inches the other way have another go see if it's right yes no and when you got it right hit the red button and with a bit of luck it did the same as on the rehearsal but there was no guarantee that that would ever happen so editing was yes was very basic. Not frame accurate. Yes. I originally started in film and in fact I've been working on film for, for many years in the BBC as a film editor before um, I, my, my department, film dis department realised the writing was on the wall and we were going to have to start to look at using, working on video. And it was only possible because the BVU, the, U, the cassette tape, the Umatic cassette tape had come out, one, so therefore it was easy to load. The cameras had got lightweight. Um, and two, the particular SP version of the Umatic was accepted as a broadcast standard by the BBC. Um, and there was a reality of the future, much as a lot of film editors were thinking, but, 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 you know, it's, we hadn't really appreciated this whole concept of non-linear and linear, but they could see that tape was a linear system. You couldn't be as creative and as flexible because you had to lay a shot down, record the next shot onto tape, record the next shot, and if you suddenly just wanted, well, that's, I don't really want that second shot at all, you, you, you had to go another, you had to make a copy, a new copy, and actually then edit that shot out as you made that copy. And that was going to be a rather tedious process because the, the whole art of filmmaking is doing lots of changes all over the place. Also, if you're copying it back in the old days when it was composite, the quality oh. goes down, so it gets fuzzier and fuzzier, fuzzier the more you do fuzzy. it. Absolutely. In fact, I do remember in the very early days when we, were, I'd, I worked on a pilot for a direct with a, with a director friend of mine for the B, but some like pub conversations, and our technical and training department said we just got in a, an early VHS offline. Would you like to have to use that as a free as a free edit? And well, I said, oh, it's fine. So I said, yep, okay. So I had a little quick bit of training on how to use it, and so we we, we transferred the rushes off Umatic or whatever it was onto to VHS and. And then I started editing and I you know, went to generation and then right, I said, let's start cutting it down a bit. And so I did this edit and um, I said to the director, what do you think, is that, all, is that all right me trimming it there? And he said, I'm sure it is, Rod. He said, but when I can't really see the picture, I'm not sure how I can judge it. <laughs> because I really was, that was before SVHS mm. and it was purely yeah. composite. And honestly, just even going a generation, yeah. it was looking pretty mm. awful. But anyway, so, to move back, we, we decided that we were, yes, we were going to start to go um, and start training people to be able to use the Umatic system. 
we didn't have an agreement at that point with the unions, um, which was rather, I mean, the un I say we, the, the unions hadn't come to an agreement to the fact that, okay, we could produce stuff on pneumatic, but would the television centre recordings department accept it from us? Current affairs would, because we did provide editors as film department to Nationwide and, and Panorama, who wanted film editors to cut their programs, and the news department who actually did the transmissions that said, yes, yes, we will accept that. So the first two editors that trained were from Nationwide, and I was on the second course, and one of them was another Nationwide editor, and myself was basically out in the general service area. And I remember after I had been trained, three weeks of training, so that we, we, we sat in a little classroom at Ealing, and there was a couple of camera crews, and there was a couple of two, two editors, when it finished, I wasn't actually allowed to do anything because the unions hadn't come to an agreement yet for the for to for us to actually for me to cut something and then for me to pass it over for transfer to one inch. Um, but when when I finished the training, one of the things we did was the film department said out to to to, to production in general, we will offer you a free half day's filming with an Ealing crew with a portable single camera, we, sorry, we called it portable single camera, we had to give it as an acronym, and, and, and we called it PSC, portable single camera, camera, which was the def, you know, for a, a pneumatic camera, separate recorder with a cable, which the sound recorders hated, um, and uh, the BVU edit system like we have over here behind me. And um, so you'll get half a day free crew, half a day free edit. So you could come up with a little project of yours and see what it's like trying to do it. And obviously for me, this was like now I'm also, this is part of my learning process on how to actually do with that edit controller the kind of things I'd like to do on, on film with split edits and cutting, the, getting out of vision and cutting the sound. So it was a very big learning process for me. And actually, it wasn't, it was fine. The only problem I had was two of the directors I had were ex-film editors. And they were slightly aggressive and almost called me a traitor to film editing. Seriously, and I was, by the time we'd finished on that little half-day session, they were accepting this was a horses for courses situation and maybe it did have a place and maybe I was able to do the kind of audio editing that you would want to do, etc. Fair enough. So. It was interesting, but I also knew without a doubt that this, to a certain extent, I had to accept that we're going to take a step backwards in the terms of creativity in being able to change my mind on things. And I was going to have to become, which I did when I was using this system, because I did go on to do a series of six half hours on Rough Justice, and, and then I eventually did a 75 minute by the end of the year, a big one on the Libyan siege. The reason why I did it well, you might say, why did you do that on, on a BVU system? Because all of the original footage that they, was shot by news on a BVU system. So the most ideal thing was, really, the best way to edit this is on a BVU system. Um, but it did mean, to a certain extent, you had to kind of, you had to be a bit disciplined, you had to be a bit organised, you had to think, you know, now, can I try and just spend a little bit more time on this sequence and get it, more, more, more right, as it were, more polished, because I don't want to have to keep coming back and play, play around with it and go too many generations. Um, because in those days, you, if you went too many generations, if you like, copied from one assembly into another, made another one, then put that over and copied again, you know, and the quality would go down, you would then have to go back and reconform, i.e. paste in from the original rushes on your final version, all of the shots. And that was obviously a bit of a tedious process. But as an editor of the time, my favourite clients had always shot on film and converted it to tape for editing. And I found very quickly, as the editor now, that the people who'd done that typically had been film directors and had a better eye for a shot and everything else. So, and they had expectations that you had set in your previous life, if you like, mm -hmm. and suddenly we're expected out of the blue to catch up with. Uh, which was probably what I enjoyed about it. I think um, people were, there was a stage where it was a lot more creative in the online yeah. process, wasn't it? Um, you know, you actually could make fundamental changes to the film in the online. But I think for me, I came from, because um, I went to uh, London College of Printing in uh, 1982, so I was there from 82 to 85, and all that time, you know, learning 
all the different skills of you know directing, producing, camera work, and everything. Um, I found that uh, even when I did my first, well, there I was editing on film, and we had 16 mil, and we had uh, VHS edit suites as well, and so um, the editing was some was something that you know I did the edit obviously created the film in the edit and my, my particular project or a group of us would have our own project and we'd finish it in the edit and it was more about it wasn't so much about the the kit as just you know getting the film finished if you see what I mean because I was I suppose I was coming at it as a director and um, and then when I went to when I got my first job after college it was at a corporate video company and I was assisting a producer um, and we made sort of on 10, 15 minute corporate films for um, um, Avis and TNT and people like that. And the, that producer would do literally everything. So he produced, directed, edited. And so I was sort of learning from him then within the confines of the gear that they had, which I think was Umatic. I think we had B2SP as well, it was GHA group. And, um, and then he left and I, I, was, I became a producer then. And I, th I feel like it was a similar process because I can only remember, I remember doing the editing, the editing the offline, I, um, and I think we could online there as well, um, and, but I don't particularly remember, I think it's a bit about what you were saying about being there on the shoot, because I was out filming yeah. it, and then to come back and I would just edit it to create whatever it was I, I was, you know, the film that we'd gone out to shoot as it were. So it was only after leaving that company that um, I suddenly started working with, as an editor, with other people's material. Yeah. Um, and that was a whole different experience. And that was, I think it was still on VHS and you, Matt, you know, it was tape to tape. I think it's worth saying now for the viewers <coughs> that we all say all these words, offline, online, mm. low yeah. band, high band. These are terminologies we're familiar with and they're not. And, mm. and what offline means is normally editing the material at a lower quality yeah. to save money Having and to then copy it, and then to copy it format, later yeah. on in the same format at the right quality on the right equipment. Yeah. Uh, so it was two, a dual process. One was preparation and one was finishing. Yeah. And I, I didn't used to call it linear editing, I called it progressive because you could <laughs> only ever go forward. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had a kind of process like that in <coughs> film really because we shot on a negative and they they would give you a rushes print from that and you'd edit that and it would get absolutely filthy and would covered with tape joints and in fact in the early days when first colour first came out you couldn't afford to have all your rushes in colour even though you shot it it all been shot in colour you were only allowed to have 10 percent of actually as colour rushes know that. yes <laughs> the bbc um, mm, mm. and then of course so when you finished then you'd go and like online you'd send off your cutting copy to uh, uh, the neg cutters and they would then go through and f match the little key numbers back to the original negative, join that all up, and then you'd send it back to the labs, and you'd then have your brand pristine new sh answer print, which is the first version, or a show print, the answer print was just to check the colour. You'd say, oh, well, I want to change the colour here or there, please. And then so that would, you'd grade it, and then you'd get your show print. So it was a similar, a similar kind of a process, only your rushes were almost as good quality as what you get back on the show print. There's no reason why there shouldn't be any difference apart from it might be a slightly cheaper stop they'd be printing onto. <coughs> I think I came a different route from most of you because I came straight in to a facilities house and I was there from the age of 18 in, what was that, 88, 89, something like that. What was that? Uh, uh, Air TV, Todeo. Oh, you know Air TV or oh, Todeo yes. there in Camden? And so I worked oh, I know where it was. Yeah, I worked my way up from... Research recordings? Yeah, research recordings as used to be, yeah. Um, and up to editor, and we, we used to do, I learned, because, you know, linear editing in those days, online linear editing was very complicated, um, much more so than offline, because offline you're doing the in and the outs and the mixing, there's no disrespect, it's just incredibly, the, the amount of um, technological know-how you had to have to get the online editor to work and all the effects you used to put on it, was, it, it required a lot of knowledge in those days, yeah. which, I mean, these days anyone can do offline edit. But online then, you had your DVE. I'm not sure you can say anyone can offline well, you edit, because the can, edit is making the programme. That's true, but you can cut it. it. It might not be good, but anyone can cut it. So they can't cut it well, but anyone can cut it. Yeah, no, I think the offline is where the programme's created. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. no, and, and then, as you say, the online... But the online, we had, to, we had to save everything, basically. Or we had to make it work, to be the truth of it. What we put out had to be the finished, final 
uh, it had to look spectacular as, as much as we could. With, with the, the approval of the offline yeah, editor? Yeah, with the approval. Not always, actually. <laughs> okay. Very rarely would the well, offline editor come uh, into yeah, us. Yeah, I don't yeah. like to hear the word, we had to save it. No, no, that's not true. I'm being a bit, uh, bit cruel there. Well, but also, we'd, we'd, you know, we'd be grading DVE, um, uh, captions on top, all of these things. I know, I know. It, and I think it depends on who you work for. Yeah, exactly. The, on the online guy certainly was the skilled with the advanced equipment. With the, exactly, but we wouldn't but be creative. The company I worked for didn't mm -hmm. like the Aston caption generator. Yeah. So the art department would create all the titles themselves and I'd bring it in and it'd be put under a rostrum camera. Oh, those are and even some of the effects, uh, an effect that you can do now easily on the Avid, for example, mm -hmm. was a ripple, a ripple between mm -hmm. one scene to another. I remember holding sheets of glass <laughs> under a Rosham camera and what have you. We so had the, uh, I, you know, the A57 could do those. But the uh, yes. editor is who makes the programme. No, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm never going to argue and with that. Being know, an offline editor. Like we would, at those times, in, different out. disciplines, that's all yes. at that point. Oh, yes. They were very different. Um, yeah. the, you know, these days you can do all the, so many of those effects in Avid. Yes. But then you couldn't do any of that in offline. I so think that, you're that, that, that word discipline mm. I, I think of as very important in online editing, which is what I used to do. I, purely specifically online editing, nothing else. You had to be disciplined because in the world of sport that I worked in, you were on the air at 10 o'clock and your half of, first half of the football match had to be finished. And it, if you made a mistake, it went out as a mistake. So discipline, getting everything, make sure you got all the goals, all the incidents that the producer wanted, make sure you can get all the necessary replays, all, all the cleverness that you can put into that show, but you have to be on the air at 10 o'clock end of there is no oh can you hang on can you ne ask network to hang on five minutes because Ross hasn't quite finished yet <laughs> no not an option um, remember many a day on ski Sunday being rung up by network saying um, right can we do the lineup now please we'd like to make sure I said well you can do the lineup if you like but if if you do that we're not going to get the show on the air I've got five minutes to go and I haven't finished yet so just <laughs> give me that five minutes and I'll get your show on the air talk to me much longer and you won't if discipline had to do it, you had to build inbuilt time clock in your head to work towards that transmission time. And that was online editing in sport uh, and fast turnaround stuff, which uh, another discipline completely, that, that's the route I came through. I was doing some of that as well. I used to yeah. do Italian football with uh, narrated by Kenneth Wollstonehome. Oh, right. Um, and exactly the same thing. You've got to get it and yeah. you've got to finish it at that point. Otherwise, it's not going to make air. And, but I mean, you know, you must have done other things as well in the online world. Was it all oh, sports? Yes, absolutely. Yes. No, everything. I did everything. Yeah. Drama, ballet, um, concerts. And they're all different disciplines as all well. All different right? disciplines. Yeah. Music uh, well, was I've, a different I've one. I've got to say, because I agree completely that we, uh, with my view and my experience over the years was as I became a, a better and better editor, which mm. I love, by the way, still do. Um, film directors would say, you must have been a film editor because you're so good. And I said, I've never been a film editor, but at LWC I was a location manager, so I could choose whether we shot on film or tape. So mm -hmm. I learned both disciplines, which is which are quite different, but the same at the same time. So one of the things I found onlining at that time, particularly with corporate clients, they were too close to their own work because they already thought their shit didn't stink and it was perfect. <laughs> And they would come in, and you would find them repeating stuff. You know, like yeah, well, the less is more. Less is and more. I would, yeah. Have you ever seen a director's cut that's shorter? <laughs> Never. <laughs> just, just pop back. We're talking about uh, offline. I and we describe what offline was in editing, either or VHS or um, pneumatic. One of the problems for me, because you you were only given a two machine suite, a player and a recorder. Working on film, we did dissolves, we did fades, we put on titles. How did we do that? Well, we used Chinograph and we did this. We drew Chinograph on the film. And when, when you were watching a film and then you suddenly saw a line appear on the film that would go across the picture and then cut and then go back, you knew that was a dissolve. Or if you saw two, start in the middle and you saw two lines going like that, that was a fade in. Now, that would either be a fade in of a shot or it would be a fade in of a title. Um, and of course, you couldn't do that on this system. You, you, were, you were just say, we're going to have a dissolve here, but um, and it will start round about now, and then round about <laughs> now. And but when we go to the online, we can define what it is. And we'll yes, yeah, so that's what I mean when I was saying. And you go to the online, and you have a lot of list of things <coughs> yes, exactly. that you really you wanted it to look like. Yeah, you know? the titles there, the fade in there, etc. Yeah. But of course, then you could do a lot more than you could with on film. You could do what you could do in, a lot more effects more easily because on, on on film titles had to be you had to send them off to do an optical. 
um, and you had to get it dead right. You know, we were one of the first facilities to have a full digital suite that you could do instant dissolves, and most of the clients used a director who'd worked on film, so that was the only place they could have been making stuff, and, and they'd say, oh, we're going to have a dissolve here, and you just go duh, 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 and do a dissolve. Yes. Oh, we'll have one everywhere now. Yes, so yes. suddenly you had dissolves everywhere. Well, it's like yeah, when they came really through the, yeah, right? ADOs, DVA, or the ADOs yeah. and the DVEs. As yeah. soon as people got DV and digital video <laughs> effects, yeah, you'd so. see them everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. now you look back oh. on it, it's incredibly really tacky. Nerf, but at that point, yeah. it was so amazing. Yeah. Like, we can make the great lovers of the latest technology, weren't they? Yeah, they were. I mean, the Star Wars Zoom was a picture with Zoom up. I remember when the Quantels first came in. The Quantels on sport. Hmm. on um, educational programs, I remember the cube, the, the rotating <laughs> cube, which <laughs> yes. was done on a Quantel, which you had to get a special effects man in for. Hmm. And, and as an editor, you'd sit there for ages waiting for him to sort out the, the, the sides of the cube. It was, it was, I mean, this was 80s. This was very uh, clunky compared with these days. But uh, I mean, the, those old Quantels were something else. They were fun um, to play um, with though, great fun, because they were also instant. You'd be there and you'd, just, you'd be turning a knob and it would happen in front of your eyes. Now with Avid, it's still, you're sort of, it's not quite the it's same, not it's not as tactile, no, it's, 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 it's it's you're dragging a fader. Job, but, um, it, but we'd it, still need it, we'd still, because I used to build lots of multi-layer things, and so we would have three machines, uh, a recorder, two source, plus the pre-read, and plus running two A66s at the same time. So you'd be running five sources at once, and mixing between them, on multi-layered multi uh, vision mixers, firing off GPIs and getting captions running at the same time while mixing the faders live. It was, uh, you yeah. didn't want to make a mistake in those days. No, so you've mm. just heard a new, a new phrase, GPIs, yeah. Yeah. GPI. general purpose, purpose interface, which enabled you through the edit system to trigger something else to happen that you couldn't time. manage with your fifth Ooh. hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. use them all the time. Yeah, of course, so, you had uh, to. And I mean, then you'd also be able to do vision mixer snapshots so yeah. the vision mixer would actually at some point run like a sixth or seventh machine and you could actually run it like a timeline. And so the vision mixer would allow you to bring on captions, mask things, move masks, and also at the same point move the DVE with the digital video, video effects around. So lots going on at once. When yeah. did choice of fonts come in? Well, well Aston had choice. Yeah. Aston the first Aston. one I had had Aston's choice of fonts. But if someone was specific? You had to buy them. Early days, BT editors never got a credit on any show that came out of a studio because they never knew who was going to edit it when the show was recorded. <laughs> so some series did, uh, and in fact I did a couple of episodes of 40 Towers but never got a credit for it. And uh, the, the excuse from the producer was, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't know you were going to be editing the show. So I got John Tidy, the graphic designer who worked for a company called Wormses. I said, John, can you make me up a 12 by 9 card? Um, so that when the producer says to me, I don't have a credit for you, I'm very sorry. I'll go in my briefcase and hand him one. I said, here you are, here's my credit. <laughs> you could have had a T-shirt, were you know? Well, was I that see. because they'd actually done the roller in the studio? Yes, the it was all done. Yeah, it's all done in the studio, yeah. yeah roller well, or captions. It was sometimes changing cards on, on right, two, on two cameras that. and the, right, the, the 12 by 9 stacked up on, a, on two stands and someone would pull a card, the camera, they'd mix to the other one, pull a card and we... Yeah. Very, very... You know, it's almost laughable these days what, what <laughs> how television was made. Well, in the final days. test at the BBC at that time for a director was that he could do 24 captions and get it right because they were pulling all of them. Um, well, when I was at London College of Printing, when I was at London College of Printing uh, doing photography, film and television it was, um, we had the film systems, like I said, and I, I don't really remember the actual... Um, classes where they taught us a steam back and they taught us the VHS. I think we were, we must have been, you know, obviously we must have had some training. We did have tutors. Um, I do remember, you know, playing around with it, especially the VHSs actually. Did any of you have training? I had no training. I had to teach no, myself I, I every single BBC, piece of kit. I was in the BBC and the BBC was always mm. good about training. That yeah. was one of the very distinct advantages. So I was, had probably about two to three weeks training on on the, the, the UMATIC, the PSC system, if I may mm. dare call it that. And then again, well, when it came to the nonlinear later, I was actually put into position to actually say, right, we're going to buy, our, we bought our first Avid, mm. and I want you to learn it, and then you start training people. So I actually became a trainer in the BBC until our own training department suddenly said, hang on a minute, what's going on there? We're the trainers. but 
but so I did do some training, and we did train people. We would take them, uh, you know, you'd have a week, a week. I would have two people for a week, and train mm. them, and it was it was interesting. So it, sadly, probably people of my generation had more problems because you know it's a keyboard, and that was certainly an issue. Um, whereas the assistants, the younger ones, oh, yes, that's, oh, yes, oh, this is quite fun. But no, we were so. In the, and then, of course, you, you'd probably be given time also to play. You, we, we, we'd have some test edit rushes that you, that with, with scripts. You'd say, no, now you've had some training. Would you like you know, you'd go and spend a week or a few days having, having a go and actually you know, get used to it? Mm. Um, well, in the two-inch days in the BBC when, when I joined, editors were editors and engineers were engineers although the editors had come from being engineers and you were assigned to a program um, which maybe let's call it an electric edited program which was the, the edit tech which, which I was explaining with the, the the edit point is defined but the the play in tape could be was purely in the control of the engineer who went back his 10 seconds now as an engineer, you would sit on the other side of the room and the editor would say, I want you to come in there or there or just before that word or just after that word. And you'd wind back your 10 seconds, put your China graph mark on, run it up. And eventually you do all this and you're in awe of the editor because how does he do all this? But eventually you would learn what he was doing by a sort of osmosis process. You would gather why, why was he asking me to tighten there? Why, why, why was that wrong? And you'd get this and then sometimes you would ask to swap over if it was a simple program and some editors were uh, conducive to you swapping roles so you would be on the other side the editor was playing into you and if you had a problem obviously you could say um, yeah I'm in trouble here or uh, having asked the producer of course if they minded if you did that and then we got on to a bit more confident you would say to some editor well uh, look you, you've got play school this afternoon it's five five programs to cut together um, would you mind if I did it? And the editor normally thought, no, that would be great. I can go and have a cup of tea. So I'd ask the producer, would you mind if I do it? And they would hopefully assume that you knew what you were doing. So you'd go in there and take on the stress and the pressure of putting a razor blade through five programs and hoping you know, that was going to go straight to the transmission suite in a couple of weeks' time. And that was a learning process there. Once we got onto single machine singly manned edit suites like using the 910 controller then you were on your own so the learning the, the learning process for new people became more difficult because there was not that role where you were assisting an editor uh, in in two inch days playing in and looking at looking at the edits perhaps the assistant on the suites was just purely changing tapes but actually learning being there right at the sharp end learning looking, watching, seeing what was going on it's also was a great than, training. Isn't it? It's more than that because it's also client management. If you, I don't, depending on oh, yeah. who you're working with, but you're learning those skills of how to deal with people's skills. To, I mean, what the facility industry did as a facility owner was we used, every year we would employ runners and runners were T-boys really and, and they had the opportunity, we would give them a year's contract if we came anything at all and they would serve the edit suites through the day and with the opportunity to stay at night and work and in the departments. It. And then if they were any good, and you knew that very quickly, if they were any good, is you get them to do the loading overnight. So they began to use the machinery hands-on. So that was the introduction. And then out of that, you are very quickly know if you've got an edit potential guy or not. Personally, I had no training at all, except that I got myself ask, asking myself uh, as I started to become an editor and became an editor and started winning awards and people started saying you're a very good editor you must have been a film editor for instance why am I a good editor and of course I stood in the, the control room of a drama unit for 10 years with the very best directors in the country and without even knowing it had learned what a good and a bad cut was because they would look to me as a unit manager and say yeah, that's all right Phil <laughs> and and you know you became a contributor cool. collaborator cool. with people like Jim Goddard Tony Warmby all those people at the time who knew how to do it so you were picking it up yet again you're picking it up and it's suddenly it's going in here so and so then the industry the facility industry develop ways of doing that and that was to make them do the menial tasks and see if they were any good at it and it if they weren't you quickly fired them. And it was one it, it, it was one problem when we when we first moved over to tape and then particularly non-linear film department 
you had film editors and they had assistants and the assistants would be learning from the film yes, editor right, yeah. and so when we got to this situation particularly when with the avid and lightworks initially we were allocating assistants but basically what was there for them to do nothing but to sit in the back of the room and okay do you want another coffee yeah no i'm fine thank you very much indeed and we very quickly realized that this couldn't carry on we were going to have to change this and of course we also the question was raised how are people going to learn how to how to operate this, the, 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 the equipment but more importantly how to edit mm -hmm. how do you know um, I'm not sure we really solved that problem, and uh, as you know, but it is an industry-wide problem, to, isn't it? I used to work on Big Brother, um, and it's actually where I met Amanda. Um, and one of the things with Big Brother is because of the, over the, the nature of it, there are lots of overnight shifts because of the fast turnaround of it, and I used to post-production supervise it at this one point. And we would have edit assistants who would be helping doing the digitizing overnight or creating copies, but also when they were free they could help the editors and so for them it was a perfect learning time. They would have that overnight time when they could actually go off and cut sequences and many, many editors have come from that route. Um, so there are still ways, but it's really hard for young people now yeah. to get into it, you know, yeah. especially if you're working on documentary. There's no, there's no call for anyone to sit in the suite yeah. or to learn yeah. how to cut. Mm. Mm. No. I think I'm freelance even worse, which I was freelance. Yeah. Tape, you just had to get on with it. But because I was freelance, often I'd be going into a facilities house, like Todeo, mm. used to go in there quite a lot. Mm. And there was always someone there to ask. I did the AVID course at the National Film School, which I paid for myself. And then again at a facilities house, if you were stuck, hopefully there was a room where the boys were doing the machine room and what have you, you could go down there and say, I don't know how to do this. I'd have yeah. the reverse sometimes. <coughs> when I was a, a linear online editor, there'd be some editors I'd work with who'd purposely try and blind you with science because they were so nervous of their job they didn't want to teach anyone else how to do it. And, you know, if you knew what you were doing, you're just like, mate, it's just this. It's, it's not as complicated as making it out. But some people would be the reverse and not help you. Mm. I think by the time I'd done um, college and then worked with a corporate company editing on tape to tape, and when I left there I worked with some really good directors, so that was fantastic but it was the, at least you know knew how to use the gear and basic editing and, and um and then was just allowed to work on doing more and more complex programs and then so by the time i uh, went to spitfire um and i was doing some freelancing at spitfire and they had a, an avid to beta test one of the first ones in the country um when i saw that i could really appreciate that um uh, you know that I'd be able to straight away edit, you know, non-linear in a non-linear way uh, on this computer, and I just completely fell in love with it. Um, but the reason I mention it is because I learnt from the manual, I had to get <laughs> literally get the manual out and like just go through it, you know. I think we've all heard that exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I was surprised. RTFM, you know, it was quite a good yes, manual. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then it was just suddenly like, okay, we've got a job coming, and it's like, oh, I had uh, to find learn on the, the job. Uh, facilities house. Well, I think the learning is a going. contributing factor of all the things we've all said. And if you've worked with a good director and you do a good cut, he'll tell you. Is it, mm -hmm. We're learning two things. There's learning yeah. the equipment, but there's exactly. also learning yeah. how to edit. Yeah. Yeah. Learning yeah. How to edit. Yeah. You entirely. can't teach editing. Mm. No. I think it's no. intuitive. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. I think watch, learn, other listen. people have to tell you that you're good at it, not yourself, because yeah. yeah. you don't know. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the things about people skills and being with people um, was important to my career because that's why Stefan asked me if I wanted to come and work with him on that machine because um, I was one of the people that got on best with the clients so that just gave me a head start and then um, I think with the machine um, yeah I just learned it you know the best I could but um, as you were saying earlier I mean at the end of the day you, you when you're offlining or you're you know Edit, making the editorial decisions and creating a program really you just need to know how to cut in and out <laughs> you know you're creating the program you just you know you don't need to know how to do many many things mm. any layers or whatever um that's why the online guys are paid a lot more than the offline yeah. <laughs> and they have to yeah they have to work quickly <laughs> um so i think um but what my memory is that um yeah it was absolutely brilliant it was you know, it was such early days that it was, there were the constraints of storage space and I'm, I remember doing hours, I did a 48 hour shift once. Um, only once. Trying to get, <laughs> yeah, 48 hours only once. Yeah, I've never yes. done that since, thank God. And, um, well, well, you know. Overnights in the facility game was normal. I mm. mean, two or three a week probably. Yeah. And of course you're not at your best. Um, 
and, and the best thing I used to find was to say to the client, this, you know, this is going nowhere because I'm about to go to sleep because yeah. we probably had two bottles of wine by then anyway <laughs> as well. So, yeah. uh, and stop and let's start fresh in the morning. But, and that was the truth. But, but, if, you've but got, it did happen. if you've got space in to book something in the next morning, you yeah. know, sometimes you're up against transmission and someone else is booked in the next day. It's got to be done. Isn't oh, it? absolutely. That, yeah, and that was a discipline of broadcast television. Mm. So, so doing a show like the one I mentioned, which is Mind Your Language, they, we used to start eight on a Saturday morning, and they'd come in with a properly marked up script, mm. and everyone knew which tapes we wanted, and it was marked up. And by four o'clock in the afternoon, you're just looking to see how much you've done and how much is left to do, and if there's enough room on the tape almost, but well, how many more shots? Mm. And then you had to do the credit roll, and then the director's wife would come in and want it in bigger la letters, <laughs> and then that would waste another hour, and then you had to get it on a bike over to LWT for transmission, mm -hmm. literally. Um, and, and so you, there was a discipline in doing that, but when I look back at my own career, what, how did I learn good timing? Well, first of all, by being in the box with directors, but you said it earlier, in live television, you don't go on the air at one second past ten. You go on the air at ten o'clock, and that's yeah. the end of it. You don't yeah, even you think don't about it. Have late planes in, and, in television. And you you know, have right. to be on yeah, time. Yeah, exactly right. And it's amazing how that discipline goes through into the edit suite. Mm -hmm. You know, in, and now it's a frame, but it's the same sort of discipline that you mm -hmm. grew up with for ten years. So. Well, that's the thing about n the new gear. Like when the Avid came in, there's everyone learning how to work differently, isn't it? Yeah. The producers, the directors. I do very, very early Avid. I, I, I did find it a bit of a constraint. One of the problems, you couldn't shuttle or jog. You could either just go forwards or you could go for one frame at a time and it would play a little bit of sound or you could go ten, forward ten frames at a, at a time. Um, and, and also, you didn't have a scrolling timeline. Yeah, when, when it you first were, came out, yeah. yeah. In fact, what I used to have to do with the timeline I would take the timeline window and I'd put it on the second monitor and fill the second monitor and fill it with the whole timeline. So I could actually sit there with my mixer, play it, and I could actually see at least it would scroll, so you'd have the whole program there and you could scroll over it that way. But it was really did come on leaps and bounds by about version four or something, five, when you suddenly had the, 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 the scrolling timeline came in, you could shuttle and jog, and suddenly I could be much more productive and go you know, backwards and forwards and really find a, an edit point much more, much more easily. Um, so I've got a question that you've triggered in my brain. What's the longest programme you've done on a non-linear format? Non-linear? Non -linear. Yeah. 75 minutes? Um, maybe yeah, I, d hour. I did a nearly two hour movie and it becomes very unmanageable. Um, that's the, and so what I did was broke it into four bits and did them as you know, oh, yes. 30 no, minutes. No, yeah, well, you wish, you, you would have I found that that was broken down in sections by the, mm. by the length of the tape because I did it on, on Umatic. Yeah. Um, yes. No. It was it's better now, but yeah, back in the old days, everything would slow right yeah, down, uh, slow yeah. to a crawl. Uh, same it, frustration as you, is what I'm saying, really, was wanting to see the timeline and see it all working. Or um, even just pressing play and then yeah. having to wait 20 seconds yeah. for it to start going. Yeah. I think I had a different experience to you because I was working a lot with MTV in those days. Yeah. And so they would come in straight from the shoot with the rushes and we would just create something there and then, sometimes with effects or... Well, that's what yeah. we did with the music videos, because yeah, no one exactly cared. And I mean, what yeah. amazed me about shooting the music videos with people like Ridley Scott, they didn't even have an idea what they were going to do. They just went out and did it, <laughs> and then we would come back and edit it, because it didn't matter. But it's also, you know, great fun with those things. Oh, absolutely. And it's, a, it's yeah. a great learning experience to go through those things. And we go, we'll try this now. And also, but it's changed, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. because of the flexibility now I have with Avid, and because you don't have to spend the time I mean, people do still do some time logging at home, but most don't. Most will come into the edit almost cold, yeah. and and you'll create it with them. So it does become much more of a well, collaborative. Becomes collaborative. Yeah, yeah, much more and collaborative. That's I think it will. What I would prefer. I mean, to do. Yeah. you guys would be able to tell me that I didn't work on film, but I would yeah. imagine now it's more so because it's all in front of you, much easier to access. Yeah. Generally, I work on hour-long programs, and they'll come into the edit and they'll have an idea of what they want to make, but it will change so dramatically in the edit and so that they have to go out and do reshoots. And of course, they've budgeted for eight weeks, um, and that will go on. The last one, I think I was on went for 13 weeks, and I came in after they'd already done eight um, to finish it off, because the story's not right. So mm -hmm. it's great if you can prepare for it, but of course, sometimes it doesn't work yeah, out. Well, that's probably a different type of program. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I think us in the BBC <coughs> had a, a different 
relationship with our clients, if you like, because the clients were staff as well. So in the early days, I was allocated to a job by a VT supervisor who would put me editing whatever it was with somebody perhaps I knew them, perhaps I didn't. And that was the accepted thing. The, the producer would come down and, oh, hello, who are you? I've not worked with you before. Yes, I'm Ross. Well, OK, that was, that was it for the day. And then the next day I'll be doing something else. And that, and that carried on for years until we, got, we did get the system. You call it producer choice, if you like, where the producer thought, well, actually, I quite like working with him. Not that Ross bloke. He's terrible. But I quite like working with him. So phone up, we get the phone call sometimes when I was supervisor, can I work with uh, that chap I worked with last week? He was good. So you jiggle the sheet. So that then started the process of editors working in particular genres. And uh, when we moved into the 90s and moved to our new building upstairs, we were put into categories of what basically you did. Whereas the early days, I used to do everything from children's programs to dramas to music, sport, obviously a lot of because I was good at it and I knew a lot about it. When we moved into upstairs, I became specifically sport and um, I lost a lot of those other things, which I did really enjoy doing. Um, I guess that's the outside world, how the outside it's world still works. It's the same. I mean, if you you get pigeonholed. You do. Yeah. yeah. You so do. You're, an, you're a drama editor. You were lucky in the BBC. You're then. an entertainment editor. These days, I don't know. You guys are the same. You're a documentary editor. It's very hard mm. to move between the different yeah. disciplines again. Yeah, because I remember initially, well, in the earlier days, um, before Pan, I worked on the news <coughs> and current affairs on the documentaries. We'd go, we'd go through the whole interview. We'd go through all the footage actually in the edit uh, mm. together. Me and the producer. Me and the director. Mm. Um, but then, you know. It, it, when we got onto the avenue in news and current affairs, it was more of you know the the interview would be looked at separately and possibly the footage, but um, you'd have more command of the footage though because you'd have everything on there. And that was another thing that changed as well because we used to put all the footage in ourselves, so yes. we digitise it ourselves into the avid. Um, and then it got to the stage where that was completely impractical, and you'd just, you'd turn up and all the footage was already on. So your job was to actually sort the footage out. And, you know, organise it all in all the bins, um, and often the producers hadn't seen it yet, and the directors hadn't seen it yet either. So then you'd go through it together. Um, uh, the so the whole organising process completely changed. But the more organised you could be, then the, the faster crunch, the edit yeah. was. But uh, clients didn't understand that, I think. No, because like, what are you doing? And you're <coughs> just, you know, sitting there trying to just label yeah, yeah, yeah. shots and. Uh, and the, as a money-saving exercise, they started to get which you've mentioned really is digitising overnight. Yeah. And then the editor or me or whoever. You'd go in there for the day, and then you have you got a shot? I've no idea because no. you haven't seen yeah, it. You haven't had a chance to look. And so again. I'm going to have to look. Can we just correct? No idea, and that makes you look awkward. And you have well, to view everything at high speed. That's what I was yes. going to say because at the end of the day, I just got time to sit there and just let it play mm. normally. Have to go on a bit of fast forward. Oh, that one maybe that might work. Yeah. Yes. No, I found myself. It took me years actually to to work out how to do the films in the time that you're supposed to do them in because I just would stay you know late looking at all the footage I just wanted to stay ahead all the time but and then um, you know when you'd have the viewings um, once you'd start you know got the cuts and you started having the the viewings what was brilliant was to be able to make the changes um, as people were sort of well there were a few things that were brilliant one was to be able to duplicate the program um, on the non on the avid so you could duplicate your program and have lots of versions of your sequence so you didn't lose anything that you'd done before. Mm -hmm. um, but what was brilliant was after a viewing, when everyone was sitting around for hours talking about what changes we were, we were going to make and you know, even though we were supposed to be kind of locking, completing the film the next day or in the next few days, um, you could actually, while they're talking, just be making the changes and trying yep. to keep up with them. Exactly, this is brilliant. Exactly, and they'd be like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, you could just you'd sit there and they, you know, every now and again you'd say what you thought about a certain sequence, but yeah. um, I soon realised that actually I could just be making, put my headphones on and just making the changes that I heard, um, heard them say, uh, you, try and keep uh, up with them. Have any of you experienced any changes with commissioner, with commissioners coming in for this sort of final say off with the programmes? For me, it's, feel, it's been the same for the last 20 years or so since uh, you know, I've been working on AVID. Commissioners come in, you're still making changes exactly the same way. They'll come in, have a sort of final say, and then you'll make the changes and go back to them. Has anyone else got anything different? Well, I was going to say that the first thing that's impressed me is that all the BBC guys have been referring to the people who they worked with as their client, which I think is the right attitude, mm -hmm. because why shouldn't it be? I mean, in my, because I own a facility house, mm. the client is the guy who pays the money. And his, his client is the guy who comes in as the commissioner. Mm. 
and the times they come in and they haven't even looked at the offline and then wonder why the programme's beginning to look like it is, it's just amazing. Yeah. It's because it's not their business. Uh, yeah. But it is the client's business to inform them of the business. And, and offline, I'll tell you a story when we're done. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I think one thing, one thing that's really helped and, and changed things is uh, being able to do the quick times. Yeah. Quick times, you know, so you do a, a quick time file of your film at any stage and you can then, you know, send oh, it to whoever needs I'm to see it. I'm not a fan of that because what happens is you'll send it off and they'll give detailed time code notes oh, Lord, yes, and then you can't so argue right. it. You can't say, well, we've made this decision for this reason and then it suddenly becomes an edict that you have to change it because they've said so and it, it can become very, very tricky. I used to leave a wrong shot in deliberately. So <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't. <laughs> <Distracted. laughs> <Like that one. laughs> oh, yes. Same for the pick up on. <laughs> Prove yeah. they watched it. Let's pick up on it and good yeah, really <laughs> prepared the change. I really like it. Something to criticise them to make sure they've had their little input into it. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's just to save, well, it saves days in the, in the edit suite, you know, with people watching the film when you can just send them a quick time or, you know. I mean, the other thing about quick time, which is really good, is that you can, um, uh, when you're you know, working with the producer and you're sitting editing literally a sequence, then you can give them that sequence and they can be working on updating that sequence yeah. and you're getting on with the next one. Why right, come before whatever, yes. Because you are, you are collaborating, but at the same time, it's all about time. And it is quite nice to have that little bit of quiet time on your own, you know, not to have to wait till everyone's gone home to I always get really creative. I always work in progress to be dangerous because very few, even good people, know what that means. Mm even though they're the ones working with you. So many commissioners who come in and say, yes, it's no problem, I can view a rough cut. And then yeah. they go, well, we need some voice over here. And it's like, it's a rough it's cut. A rough yes. cut. Yes. Yeah. I did have a client ask, why has my program got burnt in time code? What's those numbers? <laughs> well, they won't be there when we finish it. But Promise. Yeah. And this was someone who was an experienced company. Mm. You know. I had one producer came in at the, the, the final, you know, knocking. It was literally at the end of the day, and he was got a plane booked to Heathrow to go to Tokyo at 11 o'clock at night, and it's now 9.30. And he looked at it, and he said, that shot on the golf course, can we cut the grass? <laughs> <laughs> it's the storage, that, that started to change relatively quickly when you could have enough storage. You, and, I, I, and I think the other thing that did change um, and was the fact that it became online. I know when it comes to doing large form things, though um, people would still work offline, but I have a friend who, who still does very long form documentaries on Avid, and he's online all the way. What he hands yeah. over to the online suite is transmittable stuff, and all the online suite has to grade it and put, the, and put and legalise it, make sure that the colour levels, etc. Okay, yeah. and that's one. That's a dramatic change now. And so therefore, you can do all the effects yourself. You can do everything that you desire. It happened very quickly, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was Avid came in around 92, 93, yeah. and we were working online quality at AVR 77, which yes. is just about yes. considered on quality. 75, 77. Yeah, yes. we we got that in 97 where I was working. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was very, I mean, it was hard because, of course, that eats up your storage. You're, because you're working oh, at that yes, high yes, resolution, yes, 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 yes. you need a lot more storage yes, to do it. Mm. And then you'd have to be, often you'd have but to be very cautious because you'd work offline, first of all, and then possibly reconform because mm. you didn't actually have the storage to but, work everything. But this offline. Moore's law online. came in, you know, every mm. year for half the price, you've got twice as much. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And how about all the changes that if you really wanted to drive the online Avid with all the sort of extra effects and all that, how much training is provided for that? <laughs> much of you make up as you go on? I mean, that's yeah. staying late, Read isn't it? Manual. Yeah, yes. yeah you, go, you go, I know I can do this, so if you just leave me alone for an hour yeah. or so, I'll work exactly. out. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, if I go back to 96 and the uh, Atlanta Olympics, I was told by one senior editor that tape is dead, and by the time the next Olympics comes, there will be no tape, it'll all be avid. So I said, oh yes, I won't say his name. I'll believe you when it happens. However, in the four years, I, I thought, and I saw what was happening, and I thought, this is the way we've got to go, at least for some of it, because the story-making side of sport, the flashy stories, mm. they need it, because the producers want it, because they can change their mind. And so, okay, <coughs> for the Sydney Olympics, we have to have some avids. So we got, I think it was four out there, Media composers, is that, would yeah, that be right? Yeah. Yeah. Media composers out there with their own storage separately. Yeah. Now to cut a long story short, we come forward to the last one I did, which was 2006, and we were running quite big Unity systems, which is um, collective mass storage. Everybody can access everything else. And so you can feed the event, not only just your little story into the 
um, system, you can feed the actual live event. So if you're doing a story about today's pole vault, you can record today's pole vault as it happens, literally as it happens, and pull in media that evening, pull in media quarter an hour before it goes out. So that, that from looking at it from the outside as I was a tape person, that was a huge change. Still didn't do away with tape. Tape was still going a long time after mm. I left, so this editor was wrong. But I can see the, there are advantages in both. Both systems have yeah. their place. Linear editing, for sport, you see what you get. You pass it through. So if a footballer goes un, un, deep, um, unpronounceable word, you can, you can take it out, put a bit of effects in. You can't do it down an habit, in, out, take that 10 minute chunk, you have no idea what it is until you play it out. And if you're playing it out live to where that could go out. So that's the argument from my terms for tape editing, but I can see that for story editing, I, you can't hold a, a, a torch oh, to no, have it. No, no, no. It's so, so many of the reality shows now, you couldn't, yeah. you couldn't make them without the shared storage. Yeah. And Big Brother, I mean, Love Island, I think the new one, you know, they all rely massively on shared storage. It wouldn't be possible. Yeah. The last sort of 18 years, um, um, well, I don't know if it's 18 years, but anyway, no, it can't be 18 years, sorry, yeah, eight. Yeah. I was thinking of, uh, what's it, shared storage? Yeah, Big Brother's 98, 99. Because uh, mm -hmm. I was thinking about, um, uh, certain, I remember with Panorama, um, you know, well, the beginning of doing a lot of uh, multi-edit suite panoramas, fast turnarounds, and kind of working out the best ways of doing that was um, was really fun, actually. Uh, but you know, like three, anyway, well, two, three, four editors editing a film in a few days, um, and how best to do it, and you know, we really cracked it. It was brilliant. You know, uh, have, do you have a chunk of the program each, or you know, how you do it? And we just played around with different ways until we came up with a. A method that's um, you know used now. Yes, I, do, I do remember when Panorama asked me to do a special for 9/11, and we were going to have two editors, and they actually got in a little Unity for us. They hired from Gearbox a Unity, so we could access the mm. first time without having to work it all right, out. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. it was. But then you've got that other interesting thing: is that every editor works very slightly differently, and you've got to have some kind of uniformity yeah. if you're all working yeah. on the same program. Yeah. No. We, what we did was we have yeah, um, you know you have a lead editor, so one of us would volunteer to be the lead editor and then basically everyone would do their chunk. That person would ideally do the first part and then they would receive the others and then they can just slightly if, stylize it. But if you've got someone who's using cut and mix for doing your audio and someone who uses the rubber banding levels, then you've got to get those across. Well, you have a you have some you've got to have a standardization between you. Have little meetings every yeah, now and again exactly. in the middle of the night, yeah. yeah. Otherwise it's a nightmare. It all falls apart when you yeah. try and put it in together and someone's got to mix the lead editor. I mean, in fact, in Big Brother now, I think they have three lead editors to finish the, the program at the end of the day, and they all take separate chunks. Um, but of course, it's all standardized yeah. so that they know, you know, the audio channels go here, voiceover is on, channel nine, all of these things have to be exactly the same, otherwise it will just fall apart. Yeah. You don't have the time to mess around. To, to come back to, to Ross's point on, about sport, one of the, one of the problems uh, we had was how could we apply Avid to sport? Because here you are digitizing a football match the trouble is you're digitizing and you can't edit it. And I remember that Avid knew that that was yes. definitely desire, so they yes. came up with something they called chunking. chunking. Good old you chunking. Re you remember? I remember chunking, Where yes. basically you were digitizing and what was happening underneath, it was laying it down as like 10 minute files onto the hard disk. And as soon as the 10 minute file was down on the hard disk, it actually became, even yeah, though you were still digitizing, yeah, the usable. editor could access get it, at it and yeah. could start editing it. Because that was obviously crucial with a football match. You wanted to do get a on cut with it down. as soon as possible. Something I've just thought of um, that I noticed had changed is, uh, I mean, you know, obviously a lot more with the Avid Dawn of the Avid. A lot more production companies were having their own edit suites. Yes. And um, so you know, you could find yourself in all sorts of little rooms, or cupboards, and <laughs> or oh lord, yes, or actually, mm, sorry, all corporate the, companies, as yes, well. and all yeah. the different levels of maintenance. Some uh, looked after, yes. and some not looked after at all. There was a stage, wasn't there, when I think the, we were talking about this um, before about how the BBC were looking to have everyone and to turn it into producer, director, editors, and that they were all going to be working from hot desks, and people were going to be working from headphones. And thankfully, oh. that died a death. God, was it? Was yeah, it, was and it, was there, was it? there was a period when was it was... It was Cardiff that was setting up some massive system of central storage where everything had to be digitised in, and it would be, a, be available to editors and directors, and yeah. they'd all have an editing system on there. And, and this, yeah. so we started us, and we're digressing here, and I remember sort of asking when some guy from Cardiff came to talk to us about this, 
Uh, right, um, we've got a bit of music here. How do we... Ah, you'll have to take that down to a, a central room and they would have to digitise it for you. So, so we couldn't do it immediately. I'm not sure our production is <laughs> going to like that, the fact that we're going back to the old system of a film transfer suite. Whenever you wanted a bit of sound off disc or off tape, you had to take it down to the transfer suite, go away and wait till they decided to transfer it for you. It's interesting how, never heard any more about that. No, I mean, I mean, anyone's ever done that. I mean, we've, we do have our shared storage for, for Avid systems, but the concept of this whole, that because we also said, what happens to all of these rushes eventually? Who manages? Who decides when you delete stuff, etc.? Oh, I'm sure we'll get that sorted. I think we're very fortunate that, as I say, there was this desire to push everyone into desks and to have them all in the open plan offices, and that seems to have died a death. And edit suites now, still pretty much the same as they were 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, nost for nostalgic sake, to... Um to hang on to any piece of kit. If I had room at home, I'd have a steam bed for a 16 mil film. I have to say, and I've got one, <laughs> a tape joiner. Oh, because my oh, God, did that well. revolutionise film editing. Um, but it is nostalgia. I have no desire to actually use it again. I'm very, very happy with non-linear, avid type editing. I think if I had to um, look back over my 40 odd years and the things that arrived, came and went, I would go for the development beyond tape editing which was a thing called a profile which was a hard disk recorder that you could join up to a tape suite and it would give you instant access to any material you could clip it up and so the, the days of loading tapes and shuttling up and down were gone so we're nearly non-linear but it's all going on to tape i think the profile was a fantastic machine and um nowadays they're about uh, 30 dollars on ebay in the <laughs> states <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think I'll stick with a media composer. Um, mm. I quite like having it on the laptop, actually, as long as I've got a, it hooked to a big screen and then another laptop for you know, doing other stuff on. And yeah, I love the media composer as well, and having a media composer is great. But for nostalgia, I think it would have to be the Abacus A57 DVE because it's just so much fun to play around with. My five-year-old son would love to play with all the knobs and, and move the pictures around and all the little effects you can do with it. That would be great. <laughs> Been, uh, I was going to say, for me, it's been fantastic to see the 910 and the GBG mixer again. It's been, it has been about 20 to 30 years since I've last played with that setup, and it's just come back almost instantly. And I reckon within an hour, I'd be perfectly fine to sit behind there again and start cutting again. Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think it's built into you. And I, I, one of the things I remember to finish my bit was a tape client would come in with a one hour, one inch tape, and you'd spool through it fast just for the start of the day. Mm -hmm. And a year later, you could remember everything on it when he came in for the changes. <laughs> <laughs> just because as an editor, you just adopted a way of seeing everything and remembering everything, more or less, anyway, you know. Mm. So when they wanted that shot they'd forgotten, you actually knew where it was, more <laughs> or less. Oh, it's about halfway through, you know. You go and find it, and next mm. year you could still remember. So, uh, But I think you're also like what you're with at the moment. So I've, I've had Final Cut myself at home for two years now and and I love it I mean just because it keeps me busy mm -hmm. not busy in the brain as much as anything mm -hmm. but there's so much new stuff all the time that's why I asked the question you know mm -hmm. and and I don't have to earn a living anymore so mm -hmm. but I still like to get on top of the bits they give me and color corrections the hardest by which far which one Final Cut Pro or Final Cut X? X, I've X. Got now. I've got all three of them actually <laughs> so uh, for me, it's been like uh, time travel, like going back in time. It's been really lovely to, to see all the kit. And I haven't actually uh, edited this year, so, well, not this year, but for about a year, so I'm, uh, producing something. And um, so it's just, I've, I've, I've felt like I've uh, yeah, gone back 30 years, and it's been really great to. It doesn't feel like that long ago to me. <laughs> 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 I hear all the for sounds. Me, 32, 33 years since I first came across one of those pneumatic type edit suites. It's a long time. Do you miss them? Yes and no. I mean, there were a particular time in my life and it was uh, fascinating and, and, uh, and we did read it into submission and we did make <laughs> programs with it. Because it's, uh, it's not frame accurate. It drove me crazy. You're just trying yeah. to use it. I remember that. Um, yeah. They're close. Yes, yes. Uh, I, th I think an important thing was you walked away with the tape that was a real yes. thing. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah I've, I've really enjoyed it, actually, because tape, tape machines have 
was my total broadcasting life, going from monsters two inches down to DV cam players and just getting at the machine again. I was sent so many hours shuttling up and down tape, doing this, learning about the machine, learning about the, the insides, all the menus, what they did, learning the tricks on the edit controller to make things happen faster because my game was all about making things as fast as you can. Get it on the air, get it finished quickly, and then you can have a little relax for 10 minutes. So that, playing with it, yeah, the grass valley, great. No, I've really enjoyed it, actually. It's been really, really good.